Hell, you could say that 10,000 times and it still wouldn't be enough. It fires me up, man. I love it. Say it one more time. Shake and bake! <laughs> Does that feel good? Yeah, it rhymes. Woo. They're both verbs. Awesome. Shake and bake live. Guest edition. Εδώ με τον, ε, έχουμε μαζί μας σήμερα ένα πάρα πολύ εκλεκτό καλεσμένο, τον Άλεξ Σαράμα. Είναι ένας ε, από τους NBA coaches που βρίσκονται στην Αθήνα ε, για το πρόγραμμα του NBA School Basketball Camp, το οποίο γίνεται στο, στα εκπαιδευτήρια ε, του, της εγκαταστάσεις γνώμη του Τυρί, στην Αγία Παρασκευή. Θα ξεκινήσουμε τώρα μαζί ένα podcast, έχουμε να συζητήσουμε πάρα πολλά και ενδιαφέροντα πράγματα. Uh, first of all, we'd like to thank you for uh, participating uh, in our podcast. It's uh, a big thing for us. You're one of our first guests, actually. Uh, actually, the second one. <laughs> so it's really important for us. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, to start, I mean, I googled you a bit so that you know can get a bit of uh, info on you. Uh, how does an English uh, man... Uh, 23 years old with a degree in history getting to basketball <laughs> that's a great question well firstly Manos thank you for having me on Shake and Bake it's a pleasure I love uh, I love doing podcasts and talking basketball but uh, this is a first for me too being uh, in uh, a Greek podcast so uh, thanks for having me on but no I mean obviously um, I grew up in uh, in London and England's definitely not a uh, a basketball country when you think of all the places where Basketball is uh, is big. I would say England is probably one of the last places that would spring to your mind. Um, I mean, when I grew up, I uh, my dad was a tennis coach, uh, but I I saw a basketball game once, uh, just a local professional team, and I absolutely loved it. I started playing at my school, and then I I got into it more and more and more. Um, and then I think the fact that basketball wasn't big in England that's kind of why. I, It meant more to me. Um, all my friends would be playing other sports, so I had to kind of fight for the cause and and say why why I loved the game. Um, so I grew into it, got played at a, a good level. Um, but then I always knew coaching would be the way for me to like stay involved in the game and and make it a profession. So I got interested in coaching very young. I mean, I can always remember since the age of like 14, I wanted to be an NBA coach. And that, really young. Yeah, I know, very young. Um, I mean, I played until the age of, seriously until I was 20, but um, I've been coaching probably since I was 16. So okay, it's so been you a, been, a long you, time. You're 23, but you're already experienced. I guess, I, but I mean, it's interesting because when you look at experience, I think every year you you try and learn something new, and especially my whole belief as a coach is it's something called the Kaizen mindset where. For me, the day I stop trying to get better as a coach is probably the day I should stop coaching. Um, so for me, I'm constantly trying to improve my coach and get better. Every day I try and do something, even if it's small. Um, so even though I'd say I've been coaching for eight years, it's probably only been like the last three years that I would say I consider myself a serious coach in that word. Uh, and I've really been trying hard to work at my craft and, and get better. Um, okay, so... How the, how, okay, we got into, you got into coaching. How does the, the NBA come in the picture? Absolutely. So when I was uh, playing at school, I, uh, uh, I started coaching some of the teams that were younger than me. So as a 16-year-old, I was coaching some of the 12- and 13-year-old kids at my school. Um, and then I, I decided to start my own basketball club. And that okay. sounds crazy, but uh, you actually started I started my own club. And it was called the Goldhawks Basketball Program. Um, we started really small. I, I hired my gym at my school on the weekends and they gave it to me for £10 an hour, which uh, in England was a big deal because normally you pay £40 an hour for a court, which is about €50. Euros. So all the kids that I coached at my school, they started to come. Uh, I was coaching them as a 16-year-old. Um, I was a few years older than them. And then we just started at the weekends and it grew and it grew and it grew. Um, By the time I was 21 and I left to join the NBA, we were one of the bigger youth clubs in England. We had a team of eight coaches, three were full-time. Uh, we coached in a lot of schools in my area. We had eight kids that were playing for England. So we grew it in a really short space of time. Um, and I was lucky because I learned a lot from it, not just from coaching, but from the business side, how to manage people who are much older than me. Um, 
you know, we had about 200 kids in the club. Uh, it was it was a really good experience for me. So that wasn't a, a youth thing, or was it? It was. So we had we had kids all the way from eight years old up to 18. So it was just uh, just youth kids. We had about eight different teams, and then we had about 25 schools that we would go in and coach the basketball for. So it was okay. quite a big operation, but. Um, I was just so lucky to learn a lot from that and, you know, learn from both successes and failures, more failures than successes. And kind that's of, the way that's how, you learn. That's exactly, that's how it goes. So with that, I, I went to university, but I kept running, running the club in my own time, studied history. Uh, it's always been a passion of mine. I studied classics and my knowledge of Athens and Sparta, you know, studied <laughs> all of that. Not just the going way deeper than the Battle of the 300, but, um, after university, I started with the NBA in London. There was an internship going, and I haven't looked back since then. Okay, so you have started uh, coaching uh, young athletes. Uh, what do you look for when uh, you know when you see a young athlete? What do you look for so that it, can, it this may translate to a basketball? Player? Absolutely. So I think the number one thing is. We tend to, as coaches, we, want, we tend to select players too early. And I think it's so important, especially at the, at the camp this week, the NBA basketball school. Um, it's really, at a young age, up to like, you know, 13, you just want as many kids playing as possible. That's the most important thing because if you've got to look at it like a pyramid. And the more kids you have playing basketball, it's like the base of your pyramid the better the players will be at the top. And that peak is like your elite players, your guys like Giannis, you know. So it's so important. If we're selecting players early, it makes that base a lot smaller. So for me, when I look at a camp like this week, I'm just trying to give all the kids a really positive experience of basketball. And I want it to be their favorite sport. And, you know, we in Europe, we're competing with soccer, with football a lot, with other sports. So... For me, I'm, I'm really just trying to give them that, that great experience of basketball so they want more, they want to come back, and they're more likely to have basketball as their favorite sport. But I think, you know, when it comes to looking at players that are going to have, have potential, I mean, when you look at basketball, obviously athleticism goes a certain way. Um, you know, you look at the players in the NBA now and you look at the body types, and yes, that's important. But for me, it, with the kids here, it's, I think, the ability to to listen and to have capacity to take on information and apply it is the most important thing. And I think some kids are really good with their working memory. They can absorb some information. And for some kids, it takes a little bit more work. And that's natural because as humans, we all learn at different rates. But um, those are just a couple of things I've been looking for in some of the kids here this week. And what you, what you mentioned, like uh, I saw uh, one of... Uh, one of the stations that you worked in uh, uh, when, I, when I attended the, the, the camp uh, back on uh, Monday. And it really caught my eye. Not, not that the other coaches were not uh, enthusiastic or something. It really caught my eye that uh, you used uh, to, to work with all the kids. Like uh, you spent time uh, uh, watching them, uh, doing all the drills and stuff. Uh, and you actually commented on, uh, if not all, most of them, uh, and you corrected them or you, you know, congr congratulated them and all that stuff. Uh, it's really important. I think uh, you had a very positive mentality. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think for me, as a coach, the biggest thing is having the connection with the players and all the, all the knowledge that I may have as a coach. The players don't really care about that if I'm honest with you. What they care about is how I'm making them feel as the coach. So things like trying to learn all their names, giving them high fives, uh, giving them like a positive affirmation, telling them if, when they did something well, reinforcing that. For me, it's, it's those kind of soft skills, if you like, that I consider actually more important than some of the technical and tactical aspects of the game. Um, so with all the kids here at the camp, I'm just trying to really focus on that and if I can do that well, I feel like my job as a coach is, is accomplished. And what about, okay, so I get it, uh, you know, what, uh, what uh, we, use, we usually say in uh, Second Bank uh, in our, many of our posts is that sports is, uh, is more than just, you know, uh, getting pro, like uh, playing uh, professionally, 
Uh, it has to offer a lot more, it, uh, especially when you're uh, younger, you socialize, uh, you get out, you exercise, uh, you meet uh, new friends, uh, all, all that is really important. Yeah. But, you know, there are some kids, there are some uh, young athletes that uh, have uh, professional aspirations. Uh, what about them? How, what is uh, the most important thing that you look for, or like two most important things or something? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I, th I think there are some kids here at the camp, actually, who, uh, who have that as their goals. And I, I think it's so important as coaches, we have to build those dreams. And it's so, it's so important. We don't want to crush those dreams. We want to build them up and encourage them to, to do that. So I think having role models is so important. And we've had like some really like some great names like coming through a, a camp this week. Um, and to have, I think just to have like Greek guys that the kids can aspire to, that means a lot. And I don't think there are many camps where you can go to and have like such legit like NBA EuroLeague talent um, for the kids to see that and to see guys that have like been there and done it, it's it's amazing. Um, I, I think the biggest thing, like it's, it comes, it really for me, it comes to the mindset. I think the mindset is so important, and you can have all the physical tools in the world, but if if you really don't want it, and and you're not prepared to put in the hard work to have a growth mindset to learn new things to be mentally resilient. It's only going to take you so far. Um, so I think looking at the mindset with the kids, it's, it's so important. Who can take on information? Who is a good listener? Who, who is really pushing themselves within the small-sided games and the drills to get better? And those are just some of the things I'm, I've been looking at this week. Okay, so... Um, and if you want to get if into tactical stuff... Uh, I've seen that uh, you have implemented in your training many different uh, drills uh, and ways to develop young, young athletes. What uh, is uh, you know the thing? What are the things that you emphasize the most? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so for anyone that's heard of my some of my coaching ideas, whether it's been on Twitter, I, I mean, I post quite a bit on Twitter. Um, I'm probably known for being quite a big. Uh, advocate, a big supporter of a uh, games-based approach to learning. So what that essentially means is using games to teach the game. Um, and I feel like when we look at basketball practices, the game now is so different to how it was played 30 years ago. You know? we'll and we're going to get into that. <laughs> but the game is drastically different. But when I actually look at practice sessions, I don't think some practice sessions are actually too dissimilar from how they looked 30 years ago. And we see a lot of what we call fake fundamentals with uh, uh, things like three-man weaves, uh, zigzag drills, a lot of unopposed practice where there's no defense. And for me, we have to consider this. When in a game do you ever play without a defender? Ever. And for sure, there's a benefit to playing 1v0, 2v0. You know, that means playing without defense. And... Of course, it's useful when you're teaching something new after a warm-up to give the kids confidence. You need, you need some of that. But for me, I, I, I believe it becomes a problem where we have all these practices and 80% of the practice time is on zero, you know, with no defenders. So a lot of the stuff I've been trying to do this week uh, is using this games approach where we're having the kids making decisions the whole time. Because when we look at basketball skills... And let's take in context uh, a jump shot. Let's take someone like Steph Curry. Every time Steph shoots a jump shot, he's making that decision, am I open or not? And the decision is what comes before the actual technique part of shooting the shot. So we're really getting into it now, and some of your coaches might like this, but if we, if we consider it like a maths equation, and we take skill and the equal sign, skill equals decision plus technique. So for me, in all my stations, I've been trying to combine both those elements together and then you know, really try and, and see some of that improvement in the kids throughout the week. And I saw a quote uh, of yours. I don't, I don't remember if it was on Twitter or uh, somewhere else. That you said that uh, nowadays we say that uh, uh, young athletes or kids, they don't know the fundamentals. But since the game has changed so much, there's no one that has... Uh, you know, 
change the way teaching these fundamentals yeah and implementing uh, them in uh, in our game um, what's uh, i mean more important is it like kids uh, focusing on their uh, personal uh, development or kids focusing as parts of uh, of a team no it's completely on on their own development um and for me i think when we're looking at like youth basketball we have to teach conceptual play we have to teach them concepts and if we're if we're just going in and teaching horns five on zero teaching complex plays we're not helping those players in the long term we're putting them in boxes and they're not they're not going to develop and be the best players that they can be and and truly fulfill their potential so for me and you raised a really interesting point man it's on fundamentals and what fundamentals actually are because for me i consider some things which are actually meant to be flashy as a fundamental skill for instance today we are working on one hand passes off the dribble that to me is a fundamental skill and you know some some, some coaches, coaches yeah. maybe maybe cringing if if they if they're hearing this but that's a pass you have to be able to make now and you know i'd say the next game you watch watch the number of two hand chess passes and then watch the number of one hand passes it's probably going to be 90% to 10% and for me it's when we look at fundamentals we got to prepare players for what they see in the game and for me like when we look at finishes euro steps behind the back layup a wimmel layup a stride stop these aren't flashy skills these are skills that are essential and and they're needed because in a game we don't get uncontested layups it happens maybe three four times a game in transition so i think we got to you know look at as coaches we have to consider what these fundamentals are and and closely match them to what we're seeing in the trends of of modern basketball going back to the original question however um i think when kids get older for sure we we have to have a mixture of concepts and sets because if we want to prepare kids for the next level the next level naturally you, there are a lot of sets and there are a lot of conceptual play it depends on a team basis but for me you know when kids are u16 and under it's it should be without it sh- there should be some some organized structure but it's it's more free flowing it's more you know making reads making decisions uh, not being rigid with rules um leaving you know space for kids to explore playing them in different positions and i think if if we do that as coaches we're doing the best job that we can to our players to facilitate an environment where they can grow and and be the best versions of themselves and if i could add to that and correct me if i'm wrong but the game now moves so fast even in europe it's a, it's a lot faster than it used to be and uh, all these uh, decisions all these flashy decision even uh, are part of the game like for example when uh, we have such great athletes that can run the court so fast a cross court one handed uh, pass is it's it's an important tool to have it uh, admittedly so i mean it's really important that to have this implemented in the game of uh, young athletes and to not to get them out of these boxes uh, uh, that basketball coach used to teach and they're not bad boxes or anything but they can you, i think that you can get to that later uh, whereas building the fundamentals when you're older is a lot, uh, a lot harder. 100%. And you know, let's take this with a good example and as a challenge point. Let's look at Giannis, right? If Giannis was told for his whole career to never dribble the ball and to just be a big man that rebounded the ball, set some screens, and then played only inside, would he be the Giannis that we're seeing today? probably not and i think there are so many players who have that who you know i'm not saying they have the same potential but have potential to be more versatile and do what they want but as coaches sometimes it's so important that we you know look at other ways and open up, up open up our minds to different ideas because if if all kids are positionless you know we shouldn't be putting ki- kids in boxes by giving them a, a position encourage kids to play everywhere that's the true meaning of positionless and you know that's we don't want to be preparing kids for where the game is now but where it's going to be in 5 years and it's going to be even more positionless than it is now and to add to that i think that kids enjoy it more as well because most of these kids will not become uh, professional athletes uh, that's the truth uh, but they have to enjoy the game they have to to play to to do flashy stuff because that's that's what they like that's what they enjoy and 
they're gonna tell uh, their friends about it. Yeah, it is. And if you look at a kid, I think the number one attraction to basketball is that you can do everything. It's not like other sports where you're in specific positions and you're maybe only allowed in one once one part of the pitch or in one area. Basketball, everyone is everywhere. Everyone has a chance to do everything. And things, the sk the skills like dribbling and shooting, especially with younger kids, that's what they love to do. So naturally as coaches we should give kids as many opportunities to do those as possible in the practice environment okay so let's say that uh, the coaches are okay uh, i mean you or uh, your assistant coaches or the other coaches uh, or you coach uh, how does parenting factor in your uh, line of work how does what are the advices that, uh, that you can give to uh, to parents uh, of young athletes. Yeah, so I'd say I definitely know with some experience and uh, I used to kind of be like, oh, I, I can do my own thing. I don't need the parents. And I, I, I kind of look at them and, and uh, look at them as like outsiders in a way. But the biggest thing is you have to work with them and you can't, can't, have, you can't be against them. They've got to be closely incorporated in your program because... When you look at the time that parents spend with the spend with with, the, with their child with their children, it's way higher contact time than you as a coach, way higher. You want to have them on your side. So you got to have them on your side. So for me, it's I think if you're in a club environment, um, like doing like parental education in, in terms of things like how parents can best support their kids, I think that's invaluable and just. Being able to have that relationship where, as coaches, you can speak openly and honestly with parents, it's so important. And I think looking at things like uh, the car ride back from, uh, from games and, and training sessions, um, that's been shown to sometimes be the worst part of a kid's experience. Where, you know, after a close game, maybe after a loss, the, the parent, you know, typically goes into conversations about the game talking about the players talking about the coaching decisions so just having like simple uh, awareness where you can talk to parents about how impactful the car journey home is and what what type of things you can be saying to encourage a growth mindset instead and research is so and things just things just like saying i love to watch you play um and you know talking about how you can encourage behavioral things such as you know teamwork respect that's way more important and that's what the kid wants to talk about as opposed to their actual you know the an analysis of their whole performance yeah there's no selection or it's so exactly important. that's really important so what we hear what we hear you say is like sometimes there are some conspiracy theories for the NBA like they, they have a, some global view uh, of basketball like a global strategy I mean, not only the way that uh, youth leagues uh, uh, are approached, but also in the, in the actual NBA, like, uh, for example, refereeing, or uh, I don't know, that there are some central views that uh, are conveyed to the players or to the coaches, or, uh, for example, foul or don't foul at the end of the game. It's like, uh, you know, some uh, global strategies. Is there uh, such kind? Is, is there uh, such a thing? And if yes, can you talk to us a, a bit about the NBA's global strategy for basketball? <laughs> so, I'd say this. I think for me, it's amazing seeing the NBA and how how informed and involved our NBA players are in uh, issues, and not just issues, but current things which are going on in society. And I think it's amazing to see how we encourage. Um, our players to uh, use their voices as platforms and to use their brands. Um, I can't think of many other sports leagues which openly, certainly the U.S. exactly certainly the U.S. where you know the players are so so encouraged and welcome to use their platforms to speak out about things which are important in society. They're so involved in the community. Completely. So it's it's so refreshing for me, and I feel so proud uh, when when I see that happening. Um, and in terms of what the NBA is doing globally, we have such a, a big and positive grassroots program. Uh, junior NBA is inspiring millions of kids throughout the world to play basketball. 
And here in Europe, we've got a really big junior NBA program. We have partnerships with 28 countries, and we have over 60 leagues now. It's really growing. Here in Greece, uh, we've, we've obviously got the, the league here in Athens. We just, just finished two weeks ago. Um, and just through kids having, having that NBA brand, you know, being able to put the NBA jersey on and aspire to something such as that, I think we're really going to see the results in a few years in terms of seeing more kids playing basketball uh, and hopefully that means more NBA fans but really for us it's just we want to get as many kids bouncing a ball as possible, as many kids falling in love with the game and if we can do our job to really positively impact the youth basketball space then we're happy. And it's that, that logo that uh, you know the NBA is, is growing so, so much and so fast and you mentioned the, the final uh, of the Junior NBA here in Greece. I attended the final and, you know, I, I've been uh, an NBA enthusiast like for, uh, for the last, uh, the, I don't know, 15, 20 years or something. And uh, to watch young kids play in a Minnesota Timberwolves jersey and a Washington Wizards jersey in the final game in Greece, it was like so weird and so, so nice at the same time because they enjoyed it so much. Uh, you know, it, and you get, you start to get that global aspect, and you see that the NBA also encourages it. More and more athletes go to Africa, to Asia, uh, Europe, uh, Southern America, you know, everywhere, and that's that's uh, really nice. And you know, we're starting to get a bit into the real NBA. I mean, the real NBA, like. The grown-up, <laughs> uh, and doing that transition, have you have you ever had the experience to to witness uh, from uh, a close or to coach even uh, an NBA player or uh, you know an NBA prospect? Uh, and if yes, uh, what what was that like? Yeah, so I mean, um, when I first started, one of the first ever NBA events I did was called Basketball Without Borders. That's uh, part of our partnership with FIBA. Uh, we have Basketball Without Borders camps. Each year they take place in different regions. So the one we had in Europe when I joined was in Finland, and it was for some of the top boys and girls aged under 17 uh, coming from various different countries in Europe. Uh, and I remember there was a kid, Isaac Bonga, um, and now he's, he's, he's playing with the Lakers. So for me, that was kind of the... The first batch of players I work with, those that like the first year or two that are now in the NBA. Um, and I actually just came, I came straight to here in Greece from Latvia where I was at BWB Europe, which was in Riga. Uh, again, we had some really amazing prospects there. Uh, and it's really exciting because I, I think it's, it's great to see their journey and see them as 17 year olds and now I'm going to be closely following their progress over the next two three four years and just to see how they grow each year add new things to their game until they become fully fledged NBA players okay that's uh, that's really nice and going back to a bit now to kids but it can also translate to, to to men playing basketball we're now in a social media era. Uh, you have the parents I mean, cover that, have the coaching. Now have the social media. When you're younger, social media is more about your friends uh, or, you know, less fans than, than usual. When uh, you become older, uh, it seems now that uh, players uh, are more, you know, involved with their social media and are become more self-absorbed, like... When they're uh, going to a game, or when they're leaving the game, they, they start to check their phones, uh, check uh, Twitter, what uh, what someone told about them, or uh, you know, a comment on YouTube or something, and uh, they don't communicate so much with each other. Does that? How does that affect you know the concept of a team? Is it uh, like are people uh, are players become more selfish? Yeah, I guess that's just you know. As we continue to, as society continues to like grow and age, there are, I think there are, each generation deals with something new that comes up, and I think with this generation, it's obviously social media. But I think you know you you can't like when we were speaking about parents. I, I don't think you can be extreme and ban it. And 
it's great to see so many NBA players that use their social media to actually positively promote their brands and show all the positive work of that course, they are doing. Because there are positive stuff. Completely, completely. So I think it's, you know, it's got its positives and negatives. And it's like anything, you know, too much and it's, it's bad for you, too little and it's, it's bad for you. So I think it's, it's really just the question of finding the right balance. Um, I think especially if you're in youth teams, something I like to do sometimes when I'm at camps is have certain hours during the day where cell phones aren't allowed and just especially at things like team dinners and breakfast whenever we want to do a team activity i just really want to encourage that time for connections for the kids to speak to each other get to know each other and just things like that can little things like that can have a big big improvement on your team culture okay and now we transition full into NBA mode. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm flying around a bit on topics here. No, uh, it's I mean, no problem. Uh, nowadays we witness an increase in pace. And, uh, you know, everything is so about uh, advanced stats and everything. And uh, Math Har- Harib has really gotten into basketball. And we see, for example, uh, a declining da- diversification in shot selection. Uh, we see more three-point shooting, uh, less mid-range. Where does the league move from here? Yeah, that's a good question. Where does the game move from here? Yeah. Because, I mean, uh, watching basketball in Greece in youth league, what, uh, for example, even in the, in the final game of the junior NBA, I was watching it, I thought, like, what? Why are they not shooting three point, three pointers? Like they, they shot only three or four or something like that. The kids were going to the basket, were shooting mid range mid range shots. Whereas if you see professional basketball, it's trying to transition to the other end. Yeah, and it's interesting because I think also in in the NBA, it's really like a a team by team basis. I think Houston are probably the most famous example of a team that's really really relying on that on those analytics and really going away from mid-range and placing em- an emphasis on on the th- on the three ball um i think it's as we continue to grow it's it's probably going to be even more common to to see like less mid-range shots i think when you look at it statist- statistically it's just looking at the numbers it's it does make more sense to shoot the three and when you look at the the field goal percentages of, of NBA players and like the points per possession, I can see why why Houston have gone down this route. But still, I think it's so important that we get a balance between looking at the numbers and then kind of the softer side of it and knowing your players and individual like characteristics and personnel because for some players, it might be a strength where they're particularly good in the, mid, in the mid-range shot. So for me, a lot of coaching for me is using ifs and... I think if we if we set rules and we're like absolutely no to like no mid range, I think for me everything kind of depends on on the scenario and the situation. And obviously basketball is a complex game. No no possession is the same pretty much. So I think it's so important to have a degree of flexibility with all this. Yes, you gotta take what the defense gives you. Of right? course. Uh, and. It really depends on uh, the tools that you have as a team. As a team. Exactly. Uh, what we also hear and what we also see that in the past it was a lot harder to, to hide uh, a, a solid defensive player, uh, uh, sorry, a non defensive player. Nowadays it's the opposite. We see that uh, offense has a bigger role in, in today's game. And uh, that's the. Does this undermine the importance of uh, of defense? I would say that a good example is just the NBA Finals and looking at what happened with Toronto and, and looking at a player like Kawhi Leonard who had an unbelievable season. And I think when you look at Kawhi, he is the ultimate two-way player in exactly. terms of defensively incredible, a great on on-the-ball defender, can contain players really well, very rarely gets beaten off the dribble. Then on the offensive end, he's extremely skilled. Extre- he, he can score all levels. He can shoot the three well, shoot mid-range, finish at the rim. So for me, I think Toronto's success was because of his two-way ability and the fact that not only could he, could he score and he had some massive games offensively, but on the defensive end, they could rely on him. So I think that's a good example of how 
there is certainly a value on the defensive end and like on ball guys like if you look at some of the best on ball defenders obviously you know a few years like looking at guys like Tony Allen but then recently guys like Avery Bradley the ability to disrupt and and be a downright nuisance on the defensive end I think is extremely valuable and play uh, teams and, and NBA personnel still have a value in in those guys but obviously when we look at this idea of a two-way player that's kind of guys like Kawhi are, are the ultimate and they're very hard to get and I think that the NBA in basketball in general is becoming a lot more demanding than it, than it used to be I mean one-way players uh, even in often uh, the offense game or in the defensive one used to exist and will continue to exist nowadays since you know uh, teams are playing faster teams are, are shooting more it's normal that uh, you don't get so so such an importance of uh, defensive players and especially you know for example the freedom of movement uh, now in the NBA it's a lot harder to get uh, under you know the skin of, of a player or something like that and uh, it's really important that you can uh, contribute to the, your team in offense. Otherwise, you know, teams are going to cheat and, you know, they, straight up they're not going to defend. Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, ultimately where we look at where the game is going to be in 5 and 10, I think shooting is the master skill. There's no doubt about it. And quite simply, if you can't shoot the ball, you're not going to be guarded and you're basically playing 4 versus 5. Um, so... I I think that shooting is such an important skill. Any player, regardless, if we really want to look at positionless basketball, um, every player has to has to be able to shoot the ball and be a threat from three. And you mentioned Toronto. Uh, of course, Toronto is coached by the by Nick Nurse and uh, an English uh, coach. So he's actually an American, but spent yeah. years in England. So yeah. obviously the. The British connections are, are there. Okay. They're, they're what deep. does this mean for uh, basketball in the UK? Yeah, I mean, I, I know certainly a lot of people that had uh, ties to Nick and maybe even were coached by, coached by him or supported teams that he coached. I think it's just incredible that, and it shows the journey of a coach. And I was actually speaking to a close friend of mine, a guy called Ashley Cookson, uh, like me, a young English coach. We both want to coach in the NBA. That's a, a long-term goal. And for us to see a coach like, like Coach Nurse, who has been on that journey as a coach, he's been through the up and downs, and it's taken him literally years until he got that breakthrough. And it was a journey, like step by step. It he wasn't an overnight success. And you know, brick by brick, each year he he, he moved further. He moved further. So. For us, it was just, it's really inspira inspirational that you can see a, a guy that works really hard at the game, wants to improve his craft, and is a hell of a coach. And just to see that people like Coach Nurse have been in shoes not too, like, quite similar to ours, and just to see that journey and that trajectory of his career, it's, it's amazing. So, you want to be an NBA coach. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a nice goal. It's a hard goal. Uh, I hope I hope uh, that uh, you get to become a uh, part of the team. <laughs> Thank you, man. Why not? Why not uh, the head coach of the team? Uh, but what coach? What is the coach that has? I mean, we all get uh, inspired by someone, or uh, you know, some philosophies in life have uh, influenced us uh, in many ways. What is the? Can could you share with us some? Of the basketball coaches mm -hmm. and the, their philosophies or uh, absolutely you know. so i've got i would say three of my biggest influences would be uh guy called mike mckay of basketball canada um he is a legend and i think world class when it comes any coaching at any level um and some of mike's stuff is i've just studied as much as i can online and in person whenever i've you know, and I had the chance to be with him, and uh, I learned just watching him. I the amount that I learn and, and take away, he's completely changed the way I see coaching. Chris Oliver is another big name, a guy who runs basketball immersion. Um, 
I I really like admire what Chris has done with his site and building the following that he has and trying to make this idea of having decision making more of a popular concept amongst this, coaches. This is a, a very important thing because you know we watch the NBA, watch the uh, Euroleague or something. Yeah, th these are not just the you know the, I mean certainly these are yeah. uh, some of the best coaches out there. Exactly, but uh, there are so so there is so much more to coaching. That we we casual fans or you know uh, cannot uh, cannot see. Oh, completely, cannot. completely. And there are great coaches at all levels, and not just in the NBA and Euroleague. Exactly. I mean, I, I've been so fortunate traveling to like I think 40 countries since I've been with the NBA, and every country I go to, like just having conversations with coaches there, I come away with so many new things, and that's what's helped form my philosophy as a coach. But I mean, those are just some examples of guys that have a, had a big influence on me. And then just watching NBA teams, watching as much basketball as I can, as every time I have a conversation with like NBA coaches or whatever, I come away with new things that I write down. And all of that kind of goes in into my cup, I guess, if you like. And I take that, tweak it, and that's kind of what becomes my, my philosophy, what I'm comfortable coaching. So who is the third one? Third one is a guy called Brian McCormick. Um, He's written what I consider to be the best books coaching related in basketball. Uh, a particular favorite of mine is the 21st Century uh, uh, Guide to Coaching. It, it really challenges some, uh, some deep held beliefs uh, and traditions in terms of what we consider coaching to look like, sound like and feel like. Um, and I think- Can you give us an example? Yeah, absolutely. So he talks about um, the whole book is basically a comparison between the classical coach and the 21st century coach. And it comes down to everything from like how you give feedback in the 21st uh, century approach to the classical approach. And like the biggest thing in terms of when you look at your practice design and how you run practices, this kind of classical idea in terms of you make the players better by reducing errors, by fixing things, by correcting. Whereas the 21st century approach is you're opening up the opportunities for the players. You're giving them different, different solutions to, to you know, problem solve and come up with unique things which are applicable for the scenario that they're in. So the whole book is just, it's really fascinating and I, I really recommend that any coach listening to it gets that book and also reads Fake Fundamentals because that's, that's a really good one which challenged a lot of, you know, the beliefs I had because when we look at coaching, most of us coach the way we were coached as players or the, the way the first coach we worked with coached. So for me, it's so important that we, we open up and we really look at all the styles and we have an awareness of different ways that we can coach. And then with that, you can kind of build your own style. How would you build your own style? I mean, how... This is a very broad question. I, no, I, mean, yeah, I, 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 I imagine it. that I could have you like, talking here for an hour. Yeah. Uh, but uh, if you would have uh, some points, you know, the most important ones, yeah. where if you could translate this to, for example, uh, certain styles uh, of offense or yeah. uh, certain style of coaching in the NBA or something like that. I, I think firstly you have to look at the environment that you're in as a coach. And that comes down to not just the local environment, but the country you're in and the unique constraints that you have in your country. For instance, in England, you know, we have two practices a week and that's it. So any time that you have, you really have to be so efficient with your time and you really have to zone in on those, on the skills that you want to focus on. Whereas in other countries, you know, more, you could have more contact time, uh, differences there could be like a national way to play the game a style of play that has been encouraged by the national federation and the national teams and that's what you know young players want, want to work on or maybe it could be the club that you're you're in maybe there are some actions of the senior team that you want to build your kids in the youth program to to be able to do when they get to that level so it's it's very scenario based it's, it can be very specific but i think when it comes down to building your style it's really what you're comfortable with at the end of the day and uh, for me as a coach, when I first started learning about, um, you know, even things like games approach or how to give, give feedback in, in, uh, in, I'd say, a more modern style, it, I, for me, it, it suited my style. I'm quite a calm coach. Uh, 
I'm quite laid back and for me it, it was a fit so ultimately it comes down to that and if you're not comfortable with something and, and you know you shouldn't it doesn't mean that you necessarily have to do one approach because if, at the end of the day there are so many different ways to coach to coaching um, we can never say there's a right or wrong, wrong way there's certainly evidence and there's an evidence-based approach uh, evidence-based approaches to coaching but you know there are so many different ways to get to the to the end of the journey so many different routes you can take so like more of a brad stevens guy. yeah if i was <laughs> if i was going to say nba I, i love brad just because he's he's so calm and i think it's so important to be like that because if you're calm as a coach when it comes to those close situations in the fourth quarter I think that's when when your players respond the best if you're able to be calm in the clutch, so to speak. But um, I just love watching his practice. It was great energy. He had such a good presence on the court. Uh, it was fun. It was engaging. And, yeah, it was a really enjoyable practice, the one that I saw. And everything is so calculated with him. Uh, I mean, if Dom was here, you know, the, my friend that were doing the podcast together would be really glad to hear you say this because he's a <laughs> diehard the Celtics ah, there you go. but uh, now he's in New York he's gone there for the draft okay no I'm kidding <laughs> <laughs> he's in New York but he's not there for, not the, there draft. for the draft uh, but let's talk about the draft uh, I mean I imagine that uh, you're based in Madrid I don't know if we mentioned that uh, the time the timing of the, of the games is certainly hard for uh, most of us in Europe You have to stay up late, uh, and then go to work uh, the next morning. So it's really hard to keep a, a tab, you know, on all these prospects that go into the draft and all that stuff. But uh, do you have like a special preference? Something, uh, you know, some players that uh, obviously Zion Williamson is a, yeah, is a big name, exactly. but uh, you know, except for Zion, I really like R.J. Barrett, and he was actually he played at our BWB Global Camp uh, two years ago in L.A. during All Star Week. Um, it was, you know, he's he's had some journey with the Canadian national team. I think he's won. He's an incredible player, so I'm really excited to see how he does in the NBA. And also got to support our Europeans, uh, Gogo Betatse from, uh, from Georgia. Obviously, he was also another BWB Europe uh, alumni. So um, I really want to see really him nice do season. well. And yeah, exactly. He really with Euroleague, you know, obviously getting that individual success, being recognized as the rising star. Um, yeah, I love to see him have success at the at the NBA level. Okay, so you've uh, coached in uh, in the UK. You've coached in uh, in Madrid. You've uh, gone all around Europe. Uh, you know, all these camps, uh, so many kids. You've, it's really admirable. You're changing. Uh, kids lives uh, you know by giving them, uh, giving them uh, something to work on something good you know to exercise something that uh, makes new friends uh, for them and all that stuff and you, this is your first time in Greece uh, what do you see in the I mean not in a certain kid or something but as a general uh, you've seen uh, young uh, Greek athletes uh, now for uh, three or four days uh, you've worked with them What do you think? I'd say, and I don't want to say this is a cliche, but the kids certainly know how to play, and it, it's not many countries where I go to when I see that. I'd say I think the fact that they're able to watch a high level, a high quality uh, like level of basketball, obviously with the Greek league and then the various yearly club, well, the two yearly clubs that you have here, I think that really goes a long way because when the kids see that, and they kind of look like the actions that they're seeing emerge naturally that has an effect on the way they play and what they do when they're in the camp so we've actually seen some some really nice nice things in terms of the style of play what the kids are trying to do some of the decisions they're making so i'd actually say like some decisions that they're seeing and what they're trying to do i can really see that they they kind of know what they're doing but sometimes they just haven't built up the the skill in terms of the technique part of the skill properly to execute it so for instance sometimes they're they've been trying to make like a maybe a one-handed hook pass and it's been the right decision but maybe they just haven't had enough time yet to really get better that skill so they're not having success with it yet but for me the fact that you can see them trying to try advanced things 
the fact that they know it and they can see that a pass like that is there, I think that's a really good sign. Um, I've really enjoyed, one of the biggest things I'd say is, uh, I think the, the, like looking at soft skills, the kids have been a real pleasure to work with and I think they've, the way they've like approached learning and they're, they're really like, they've really listened with intent and tried to, tried to do and show some of the things that we've been speaking about as coaches in our stations and incorporate that into their 5v5. Um, and just one thing I loved is we've had, Ephemios did a great job getting so many like players coming through and inspiring the kids and some of the questions the kids asked were great and I loved how even kids as young as like seven years old were standing up in front of 120 kids and speaking in a loud voice and projecting their voices and asking some great questions and for me I think it's so important to see that the confidence is there and that kids uh, are happy and willing to speak up like that to a larger group. And I think that uh, now with Yanis uh, being on the rise in the NBA, uh, it's really important for kids that they have someone, you know, we've had players in the EuroLeague for, uh, for a long time. Uh, we've had a, a certain style of play. And, uh, and it's really nice because, you know, all these players were great players. Uh, and I don't think that if you play in the uh, in the Euroleague or if you play in the NBA, uh, you know, the two leagues are different. Uh, it's not like I prefer, I may prefer the NBA, but it's not like it's better or uh, it's different. Uh, but now we have the other, uh, you can see another way. Uh, and I think it's really important because what you say and what uh, you told us earlier, uh, it's not about winning when you're young. Sometimes you get uh, you get lost in that. You know, you want to win. Of course, you want to win. Uh, you want to, you know, breed a winning culture. But it's it's also very important to to work on your game, to to learn basketball the right way, learn the NBA way. It's uh, your hashtag, uh, and it depends on your goals. Uh, it all depends on your uh, motor, on uh, you know where you wanna go. Uh, and thankfully, no. These kids have uh, you guys that uh, it's such a great experience. Really, I was there. I was so jealous <laughs> that, that you know we didn't have this. Uh, of course, these kids. yeah. Uh, it's a whole different program, uh, and it's really great uh, having you here. Oh, thank you. Uh, so, I think that's it. We gotta leave you. You have a hard day tomorrow. <laughs> Last well. day of cap. And, and then you go, go, uh, you go, what's, what's, uh, what's, what's next? This? So I've got a very busy summer of NBA. I've got another four weeks on the road doing a lot of uh, various camps uh, and different clinics. So I've got another camp next week, a week-long camp. But um, it's, it's been a real pleasure to be here in Greece. Um, I've, I've loved it. I've, I really have loved it. And uh, I don't say that about every place that I go, but... It's just I, I've really enjoyed seeing Athens as a city. It's it's been a tremendous week, and I'm sure this is the first of uh, of hopefully many trips back to Greece. Thank you for for having me on. Can we through the last question? Absolutely. You. I saw. I, I heard that uh, you attended many practices, many trainings in the in the, in the U.S. Uh, and also here in Europe, and. Combining that with the fact that uh, you want to become a, an NBA coach, what does it take? What do you think? I mean, you've talked with people, you, uh, you know, you've seen it up close. Yep. What does it take to become an NBA coach? So it's a lot of a lot of hard work and and grinding. And I mean, being able to be happy to come in with a junior position, where it's like video or player development, and just be a, be willing to work so hard and make a lot of sacrifices to put in the time to continuously try and get better as a coach, always learn new things. Um, but for me, I think it's when I look at what, how I want to be as a coach, I think it's taking things from America, like in terms of how to manage players, the relationship side of it, it's so important. Um, ultimately, that's what the NBA is. You've got to be able to have those relationships, have that trust with your players. So for me, the ideal model would be taking kind of those skills and combining that with some of the tactical and technical elements of the European game. And for me, if I can kind of blend those together and meet in the middle, 
I think that's quite a different, you know, skill package. It's something quite unique. And I think that would be, uh, it would be really fun to try and kind of have that style of coaching and, and see where it goes. I really hope it works out. I really hope you work out, it works out and, uh, you know, some years we see you, why not, uh, leading a team like uh, in the NBA or in Europe. Thank you so much, man. So I appreciate it and uh, keep in touch. And uh, for any followers wanting to see some of my coaching ideas, my, my social media is very simple. It's just Alex Sarama. But uh, honored to be the second guest of your show and I wish you all the best with the, with the podcast. Of course, for our followers, we'll... Uh, we can, if you want, we can uh, have uh, your details. You can follow you on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whatever, uh, to see the, the great work that uh, Alex does. You know how how he influences uh, young athletes for the moment, uh, and you know uh, our followers get to say that you know we, we first uh, heard Alex uh, <laughs> uh, in second bake uh, before uh, he was uh, leading an NBA team or something. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you so much. It was great. Shake and bake! Does that feel good? Yeah, it rhymes. They're both verbs. Awesome.